Welcome to the official ABA Law Student Podcast, where we talk about issues that affect law students and recent grads. From finals and graduation to the bar exam and finding a job, this show is your trusted resource for the next big step. You're listening to the Legal Talk Network. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the ABA Law Student Podcast. My name is Ashley Baker. I currently serve as the Law Student Division Delegate of Communications, Publications, and Outreach. I am a 2L at Southern University Law Center. At the beginning of the school year, we published an article on the Before the Bar blog entitled, Five Tips for Transgender Law Students. The article received a positive response and sparked a larger conversation about cultural competency. So I've invited a panel of guests with different perspectives to talk about this issue and how it affects us as law students and how it may affect us as practicing attorneys. Our first guest is Mr. Kennedy Lejeune, the author of Five Tips for Transgender Law Students. Kennedy is a 2L, an ABA representative elect at Southern University Law Center. Kennedy is also an advocate for diversity and cultural competency. Our next guest is Ms. Dejanique Carter. Dejanique is a licensed social worker with extensive knowledge of issues that affect minorities. She's also a 2L at Southern University Law Center. And last, but certainly not least, is our delegate of diversity, Mia Sodi Tenacora. Mia Sodi is a 3L at Boston University School of Law. She has been in public service for almost a decade with a focus on gender-based violence and immigration issues. She was the founder and president of the First Generation Professionals at BU Law. Through this organization, Mia Sodi has created awareness of the struggles of first-gen students and initiatives to recruit more diverse students to law schools and provide current diverse law students with more resources. How are you all doing today? Good. Good. Great. Thanks for asking, Ashley. Thanks for agreeing to do our podcast. This should be an interesting conversation. So let me start off. If you Google the term cultural competency, a number of search results come up, primarily focusing on healthcare providers' relationships to their patients. Since you all come from different backgrounds, can you each tell us what cultural competency means to you and why it should be relevant to law students? Uh, Mia Sodi, let's start with you. Yes, so I think cultural competency to me is understanding or attempting to understand a person from a different culture. With that kind of understanding or attempt to understand, a culturally competent person can effectively communicate with that person. I think it's the ability to go outside your comfort zone on your perspectives and try to show others that you're not as narrow-minded in your worldviews. To me, Mm -hmm. a culturally competent person is someone who's willing to broaden their views. Um, It's definitely relevant to law students who are diverse because if the student body or faculty at law schools don't have the ability to effectively communicate with diverse students, then you run the very dangerous risk of alienating a segment of that student community um, and kind of can really hinder that community from growing and having like positive synergies. So that's what I think cultural competency is and really how it's very relevant to uh, the law school setting. Kennedy, what do you think? I think uh, Mia Sodi did a great job of, of summing that up. And I think, in my opinion, cultural competency is really the the ability to interact with multiple groups of people um, in respect to their cultural, racial, or ethnic backgrounds, as well mm-hmm. as people of different gender identities and sexual orientations. This also involves having an understanding of their experiences, you know, even if they aren't your own. And I think it should be relevant for law students, especially now with the changing faces of the legal community. It's becoming more diverse, uh, provides for more experiences, and the the ABA, I think, put out a report where in it showed that, you know, more women are, are attending law schools than men now. Uh, and I think it's necessary not only for students to have that cultural competency training for the changing diverse community, but also for professors. Uh, just like what Mia Sodi said, that uh, it's important for them to have the ability to understand 
their students' experiences, understand what a uh, world they're preparing them for. And I think the one of the pitfalls of not having this mandatory training is situations in which students aren't able to eloquently communicate their experience and have respect to other people's understandings. Okay. Dejanique, what do you think? Well, you guys did a great job of basically summing up what cultural competency means. Um, there were a few words that kind of jumped out to me that both Kennedy and Mir Sodi mentioned. Some of those words include differences, beliefs, value, knowledge, respect, communication. Having a basic knowledge of someone else's cultural background, um, irrespective of gender, race, class, all these things contribute to what cultural competency means. It's the ability to provide services, whether it's education, social, legal, to aid and assist people who may have different beliefs and values than what we have. And being able to just demonstrate a respect for a person um, just the way they are. Uh, We all come from different backgrounds and beliefs than our peers. And if we work together, um, we can achieve a better space for the world, period. Now, the second question is, why should it be relevant to law students? I think it's relevant to us because, one, we are ultimately going to be the first group of people to, and and I mean, in our cohort, we're going to be the first group of people to, like, kind of get the, the first bit of what it means to be in the legal profession. And sometimes in those interactions, we're not able to understand each other. And this only continues to manifest itself in a, either a negative or a positive way when we get out into the actual um, post-law school world. I think it's important for our professors to have cultural competency training because not all professors are able to interact, respect, Well, I won't say all professors, but some professors may not be able to effectively communicate, educate, teach without some sort of cultural competency training. And some of the pitfalls of just not being able to have a mandatory training is just the inability to reach someone who may not, who may fear coming to a professor. I think that kind of sums up. Okay. You guys make some excellent points. You know, one thing that I will say is that it's no secret that the legal profession has a diversity issue. I recently came across an article in the California Law Review entitled, Why Are There So Few Black Lawyers in Corporate Law Firms? Here's a brief quote from the article. Available data indicates that these corporate firms hire few Blacks and that those that they do hire are more likely than their white peers to leave the firms before becoming partners. So I want to pose this question to you, Dejanique. Do you think a lack of cultural competency is a contributing factor there? Absolutely. I won't say it's the sole factor because there are various things that keep people from going into firms or staying into firms. I mean, we talk about the time, commitment, the stress, the want or desire to have a family, the area of law that they desire to practice, student loan debt, it all plays a critical role. But I think that one of the mm-hmm. most important factors is cultural competency. Um, it's a contributing factor because it, if there's a lag, there's an inability to relate to your peers, your colleagues, your the people who you're working with. For example, I remember being educated about my hair when um, I first started to kind of look for internships. And when I say educated about my hair, although some may not look at it as a part of your cultural identity, when you're natural, which means that your you know your hair is basically gone out of your head the way it was intended to, without any chemicals. Um, I remember being educated and I thought that I had to change or conceal a part of my identity just so that I could be accepted by some of the firms that I was interviewing with. And I don't think this is the way to go because if if I can't present my authentic self at the first encounter, that you will never be able to get me, um, get who I truly am. And you, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? And I do. Having... Having to conceal who I was was very, um, it was sad because it did it did not 
allow me to present my authentic self to anyone who I was interacting with because I, I was so fearful that I was going to be judged on something like my hair. You know what I mean? So Yeah. Um, I do think that it is a contributing factor, and I know that that's just a small example of why there aren't black lawyers in the firms, but there are other situations where it may not be your hair. I remember listening to another young lady and she talked about her food and she was saying that she loved cabbage and her cabbage didn't smell like her peers. And it's something to be conscious of. And if we're living in a space or working in a space where we have to constantly be conscious and we're not comfortable, the very the, you spend a lot of time with your, your coworkers. You want to be comfortable in presenting your authentic self. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's a lack in um, corporate law firms. Exactly. I agree with everything that you said. You know, you just you want to be in an, env- in an environment where you're comfortable and being uncomfortable in any situation that can affect your work ethic, your morale, many different areas. So I want to turn to a different aspect of the conversation In preparation for today's episode, I did a lot of research and I came across another article um, that's entitled Getting Real Transgender Attorneys Talk About Coming Out in the Workplace. One thing that struck me about this article was when the author talked about how, and I'm quoting here, the T in LGBT is the least understood. And while gay and lesbian attorneys may ponder how out they should be, while interviewing and working at a firm. The question for a transgender attorney is whether they should be out at all. So Kennedy, in your article, Five Tips for Transgender Law Students, you advocate for transgender students to let people know their pronouns and to come out while they're in law school. My question to you is why do you feel that coming out in law school should be the norm? Well, first, I'd like to say that Dejanique made a, an important point that I think can transcend multiple groups of people and minorities, and that being your authentic self in the workplace is what's most important, and having that workplace accommodate you as a person and a human being is very important. And so first, I'd like to make a note that being transgender is a bit more complex than coming out in regards to sexual orientation. There's no right way or or one way to be transgender. Some trans people may be farther along in their medical transition than others, or some may choose not to medically transition at all. But the common denominators among these groups are, you know, pronoun preferences, possibly legally changing their name, identifying as a gender identity that is different than the one assigned at birth. As someone who is medically transitioning in law school, I advocate for coming out in law school rather than later in the legal profession because the law students are constantly networking and building connections. You know, I'd rather have somebody right now know up front, hey, this is who I am and this is the preferred pronouns I'd like to be addressed as and know if that's a connection that I want to further the relationship with because law school is the practice ground for the legal profession and Mm -hmm. taking those steps toward your gender identity through pronouns or other transitional steps, whether medical or not, can alleviate complications that may arise within the workplace further down the road. Because unfortunately, workplace discrimination is a reality for Mm -hmm. a lot of people in the LGBTQ community, especially trans people, because it's not necessarily a protected group. And in the article you mentioned, uh, some of the trans experiences that were documented, such as Kyler brought us, mentioned that you know, they were working in a in a firm and when they started their medical transition were removed from that firm. So I think in my experience, I personally would like to have upfront because I have people are, are witnessing my transition that this is who I am, this is who I'm going to be. And if you respect it, then that's a working relationship that we can continue moving forward in. Thank you for that. And I totally agree with you and all of your points on that. Let's turn to what the norm should be. And the ABA model rules, specifically model rule 1.1, provides that a lawyer shall provide competent representation to a client. Competent representation requires the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation reasonably necessary for the representation. 
Now, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the United States is home to over 350 languages with over 13.3 percent of the population born outside of the United States. Client demographics are changing especially for consumable practice areas like family law, estate planning, criminal law. So my question is, do you feel that law schools are preparing us for this reality? And should there be required portion of CLE training devoted to cultural competency? And I'll direct this question at um, you, Kennedy, because I think you mentioned a little bit of this in your last answer. So I think that in today's world, law schools are realizing that it's more important than ever to prepare us for this reality. Um, I think there's a lot of issues in social media, in the news, and on the public platform that have really spoken to the need for this. Um, it's already, like you mentioned, in areas where uh, doctors deal with patients because they deal with the full human spectrum. And it only makes sense that law schools should, if they already haven't, put in place a cultural competency training so that we have the same experience as law students because we, we also deal with the entire human spectrum. And I think it should be a required portion of CLE training because the world is constantly changing. Currently, like you stated, there are over 350 languages in the United States. And who's to say that there won't be more or there won't be a larger variety of people who are uh, immigrating to the United States? And so I think that because the culture is always changing, because the face of America is always changing, it only makes sense that law students and lawyers continue their legal education with regards to cultural competency. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that. Mia Sodi, what are your thoughts on that? I think for the question, do I feel that law school is preparing me? I mean, I've selected certain courses and clinics that have like a cultural competency training portion to it, but that's only because I self-selected it. I think there's a problem in law school where this is not mandatory. And so you have mm -hmm. other law students who, are, who don't participate in these, these courses or clinics and they run the risk of not having this training. And then certainly in the private sector, one might argue like you don't really need this because your clients are sort of like these type of clients and you won't run a risk of like having your bias uh, kind of affect the client um, attorney relationship. But in fact, like we're all interconnected. And I think it's imperative, especially with dealing in public interest, there is a reasonable expectation that private attorneys will do pro bono. So, you know, I, mm. I can't think of any firm that's not doing pro bono. Like, you know, every year there's a list of the top 10 law firms that do pro bono. It's becoming more and more of a priority for law firms to do pro bono. So in terms of dealing with the public and the, and the diversity that comes that is with right now in our in our country. I think we have to be like intellectually honest with ourselves and say that this is this should be mandatory at law schools because you're going to run into someone who's from a different culture and you have to kind of like balance your biases of what could possibly turn into a real risk of either damaging the client attorney relationship or even even further like just damaging sort of especially in, like, I'm just thinking like in the family law situations, this could, for a client that's a domestic violence survivor, if there's some biases from the front end of the client attorney relationship, this can cause emotional damage as well. So it, there's real risk inherent in that. And then I, I love that you brought up the model rules because the model rules definitely not only you're talking about competency and how you develop that competency is training. And so you have to have these kind of tools to know your biases and how to control them. And you're not going to get that training if you don't seek out that training or if it's not mandatory. I think for mm -hmm. most people, they think they can control their biases, but then when they're confronted with a situation that they never experienced before, 
then these biases come out in a way that it's not sort of like they never experience it. So they don't have a know-how or how to attack it or how to like mediate that a situation. So um, I think law schools have these programs, but they're not mandatory. And so a lot of students don't take advantage of it. Um, in terms of the required portion of the CLE, of course, I, I think it should be a required for this, all the reasons I just stated. Like I said, it's it's 100% imperative in public interest cases and even in, in, in the private side. Like I said before, like we're all interconnected. We have um, international businesses. We don't have corporations that are just solely operating here. Um, that's less and less the reality. So we have to understand other cultures and other worldviews other than our own. I definitely agree with with everything that you said. Um, Mandatory cultural competency training should definitely be the goal, both on the law school level, as well as in the legal profession through CLEs and required trainings. But right now, that is not our reality. So Mio, what can we do on an individual level to affect this need for cultural competency? Like, what can I do? What can law students out there do to aid in this in this problem? I think, I mean, if the law school doesn't have, like, clinics or some sort of cultural competency class that they can take, I think as a, on a personal level, you can start understanding your biases, you can start understanding maybe the lack of information that you have on of a particular culture or a particular group. And I think being 100% intellectually honest with yourself and sitting down and saying, you know what, I don't really know what the T means in LGBT. Why don't I just either do some research or talk to someone who is from the transgender community and try to understand? I think, and it goes back to like what I think cultural competency, I think it's It's the ability to go out and reach out to people to understand and to really attempt to do it because it's okay to be honest and say, you know what, I don't understand really this group or this experience that this person is having. I I think that's fine. But I think you have to then go one extra step and say, you know what, since I don't understand, I'm going to go out and get the information that I need so I can fully respect that person and sort of acknowledge their experiences. So I think on a personal level, you just have to be comfortable with yourself and say to yourself, like, I don't have this information and I know the risk of not having this information and I want to respect that other person sitting across from me. So I'm going to do my due diligence and sort of get informed in any way possible. And I think that should go with Everyone, not even in the legal profession, this could be, you know, just as like human beings to understand another human being, giving that respect, that level of respect to another human being. I think it's, I think it's crucial for just society in general, especially in a multicultural society that we have in the U.S. So I I think those are, those are ways that you can sort of uh, compensate if, you're, if your law school doesn't have these sort of like cultural competency uh, training programs. So uh, I, I hope that was, that was clear enough. But I, I honestly do think that you have to be like honest with yourself and know yeah. where your biases are. Um, because if you don't do that, then you're just going to run a risk of either just, you know, not acknowledging those experiences or um, disrespecting the person. And, and, and you really have to just, you know, not <laughs> make an exhaustive list of all your biases, but you have to be aware of them. And the way you are aware of them is being intellectually honest with yourself. Yeah. Okay. Dejanique, what do you think? I think that Ms. Odi made great points. And it's not a whole lot that I can, other than I, I agree and only other thing that I would uh, add is the communication and education portion to it. Um, going out there and trying to obtain this information for yourself is one way of kind of understanding your biases. But I also believe that because there's no way of knowing what type of person that will walk through the door, what type of client you will be representing, that as law school, 
that information could be afforded to us by having people come in and try to teach us these things we don't know. I remember um, in my master's program having to uh, go sit through a class to understand all the letters of LGBTQ, getting an understanding that not everyone wants to go by he or she. It might be even a Z. So those things were things that I had no idea because my school offered it and gave me the opportunity, it helped me to understand a little bit better. And in that education component of it, sitting down and having a conversation. I noticed that at my law school, uh, we talk amongst ourselves. People in general will talk among themselves. But what I'm saying can never get through to someone who's not like me if I never sit down and have those conversations, if they are not required. And I didn't get a chance to answer the last question about the CLE, but I really do believe that cultural competency needs to be incorporated in some required law school class. And mm-hmm. and this is the very reason, because we don't know who's going to walk the ride. We don't. Some people will not confront their own biases. People like myself, I have to be aware of my biases because I know that I want to eventually help help people, help the world. But what happens to the student or the law student who does not even know where to begin, who only works with people who interact and think in li- um, like them? That becomes a problem and instead of the solution. So sitting down, having these conversations, not only with people, but with our class as a general will really help to kind of make it normalized in the sense, okay, it's not such an uh, unusual thing to see a transgender law student. It's not an unusual thing to see a, a black woman who's a partner. It's not unusual to see these things. So I think that that's the only two things that I would add. I definitely agree. And just as you were talking, I, I wrote a little note. How can you be an effective advocate without confronting your own biases? Because you were right. You don't know who's going to walk through the door as a client. Kennedy, I want to give you a chance to answer this question. What can we do on a personal level to aid in cultural competency or even cultural competency awareness? I think this goes along with what what Dejanie was saying, that I guess the most direct way to kind of develop your own cultural competency without like a mandatory class or some sort of program is to really sit down and just have conversations with people. And I think that that, in my opinion, is one of the most effective ways for me personally to communicate messages about my authentic self and to share experiences with other people. And I 100% agree with everything Me Sodi said about having those mandatory classes in law schools. And I Myself as well uh, as Dejanique, uh, I remember being an undergrad and having safe space training where I was informed of um, people, the LGBTQ community, their different experiences that were separate than mine and kind of how to accommodate their needs within school and within the workplace. And I think that to answer your question would be to just have a conversation communicate your needs, your desires, and to listen to that other person, no matter what your opinions or biases or prejudices might be, because in the end, in the workplace, um, you kind of have to set aside those values and beliefs that you hold close to your heart. Exactly. Exactly. I want to thank you guys for coming on the podcast. Kennedy, Mia Sodi, Dejanique, I know that you guys have taken time out of your busy schedules because all law students are busy to bring some awareness to this important topic. I just want to say thank you again. Thanks for having us. No, thanks for having us. I truly enjoyed talking about this. It was such a pleasure. This was a great conversation. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Law Student Podcast. We would like to invite you to subscribe to the ABA Law Student Podcast on iTunes. You can reach us on Facebook at ABA for Law Students and follow us and all of our student leaders at hashtag ABA for Law Students. Signing off, I'm Ashley Baker. Thank you for listening and remember this quote by Ava DuVernay. When we're talking about diversity, it's not a box to check. 
It is a reality that should be deeply felt and held and valued by all of us. If you'd like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. Remember, U.S. law students at ABA accredited schools can join the ABA for free. Join now at AmericanBar.org forward slash law student. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.